去了，就四个亲，呃，没有。questions on the midterm, but if you have questions about it, you should come to office hours, you should come to DLC hours and ask. Okay. Any questions about projects or midterm, something like that? Okay, so let's jump into, uh, let's jump into exceptions. So what we did on Friday, right after the midterm introduce this new topic of how to build more robust classes. And really a lot of it had to do with this notion of exceptional control flow. So if you uh, look at this account class, and this is again within the robust account starter project that you can check out on lectures. So within this account class, you know, the basic outline is you have some data that you maintain about an account, and then you have two methods. One of them is deposit, and the other one is going to be withdraw. And so now the problem is that if you want to pass a double amount to deposit, this amount may be negative. You know, you can't really control what people will do with your method. And so if they give you a negative amount, you want to indicate back to the caller that that's a problem, right? That that's an unexpected value. And so one way of doing that is by throwing an exception. So the way we throw an exception is we create a new exception object, right? So this is just like you would instantiate a class. 
So here we have this legal value exception. We throw it. And what this means is that at this point, if you generate this exception, you terminate execution of this method, and then you go up to the caller. So you know, I can take a look at the whole hierarchy of deposit, and I'll see that it's called in three places. And I can look at deposit to account, for example. Here's a method inside of bank class that calls on account of deposit. So on account of deposit may generate an exception. And now at this call site, I have, I have two options. I can either handle the exception, so I can wrap this into a try catch, and I can catch the exception at this level, or I can just pass on the exception. So if the exception happens, I can declare the fact that it may happen. That's what I put at the top. I declare the exception. And the exception bubbles up to the caller of this method. Right, so I can open up my call hierarchy a little bit more and go to the next one. And this is where I get to main, which is kind of the entrance point to my program. And again, it's defined in bank. And so here, I'm actually wrapping this call with a try catch. And what the try catch allows us to do is to handle the exception. It says, try to execute this <coughs> sequence of statements. And if any of them generate an exception of the time that I'm prepared to handle, right, then execute a code block that handles the exception. And handling here just means you know, print out some information about what happened and just return, you know, stop the program. But it could be much more complicated. So this is basically what we've covered on Friday. Right? We said you can define these exceptions. So an exception class looks just like a normal class. You know, it has a little constructor that allows you to specify a message that's like a helpful string that will be printed out when an exception occurs. And then you can create objects of this type, of the legal value exception, and then throw them. And so you throw exceptions and then you catch exceptions. Right, so this is, this, is where, this is where we stopped on Friday. So the next question you might have about code that has exceptions is how do you test it? Remember that we created unit tests using JUnit to make sure that our code behaves as expected. But now we have exceptions in our code. So the question is, how do you test code that has exceptions in it? Right? Because all of a sudden, your test may break because an exception is triggered. So that's what we're going to cover first. And then we'll talk about the two different kinds of exceptions, checked and unchecked exceptions. And finally, we'll end with the final clause. Very often. Okay, so to go through testing, let's look at the count test. So you see that my, my project doesn't compile right now. And the reason for that is because I added the different kinds of exceptions. So if I look at the count test class, it has tests in it. And it can test the deposit by attempting to deposit a negative amount. And so this thing is going to be underlined because I need to handle the exception. Right? And I need to say what will happen. Either, either the test will fail because the exception occurred, or I need to catch it here and do something about it. <coughs> so there's going to be a bunch of these tests that are going to be, uh, you know, they're not going to work because I'm not handling the exceptions. So in JUnit, the way you would do this would look something like this. So here's a, here's a very similar, here's a very similar test, except it's withdrawing withdrawing an amount that's larger than what's in the bank account. So I again have this add test label, which says that this, this method is going to be a test. It's an annotation. But what I also have is this label that says that I'm expecting this test to throw an, expect, an exception. So I'm expecting you know, the execution of this test to generate not enough money exception. Right? So if my test does not generate this exception, then it fails. And if it does generate the exception, then it passes. So this is the way I'm testing that my code generates the exception, is by actually stating here that I expect an exception. And I have to tell you exactly the kind of exception I will get. So it's going to be the not enough money exception. Okay. So execution of this method is going to be very similar. I you know, I just start executing code, a.withdraw. A.withdraw may trigger an exception. If it's the not enough money exception, 
then my test just passes, because that's what this declaration says. But if my withdraw method does not throw an exception, then I go on to execute the following statement. And the following statement is a fail. So what this method does is it just terminates the test with a failure. It just says the test does not succeed if you happen to reach this point in my method. Okay. So here in my fail, I can tell you, I can provide a little message that says, if you get here, if something is wrong, you know, perhaps uh, you know, withdraw calculated, you know, did some correct calculation. So I can run these tests just like I would run normal tests. I can run as JUnit tests. And then you'll see that they all pass. And so this withdraw, withdraw statement must have triggered this exception in order for this test to pass. Any, any questions about testing exceptions? There are a bunch of stuff in. Okay, so what, what would happen if I, so this is my account, right? I initialize an account that has zero dollars in it. So what if I initialize this account to have two hundred dollars in it? Would this test pass or would it fail? money left after the withdraw. So withdraw is not going to trigger the exception. So if I if I execute this test, withdraw too much money, it fails. And then I have the little stack trace down below. And it says unexpected exception and assertion error. <clears throat> and the assertion error is exactly you know is exactly this error. So we were able to execute the withdraw statement and it didn't trigger the exception so we failed the test. So if I change this back to 100, now I am over by $1.50. So this test will, will pass. Okay. So the same thing for withdraw a negative amount. So a negative amount is you know, should trigger an illegal value exception. I'm not allowed to withdraw negative numbers. So it's a different kind of exception. So you know, I just change the kind of exception that I expect for I'm from this test, right? Because withdraw can trigger two types. So that's why there's the two throws here in my, in my signature of the, of the test. But the one that I expect now is gonna be the legal value exception, right? So this test works right now. But if I try to withdraw, let's say I put the same statement here, 101.50. Right, so now I'm going to get the not enough money exception from this withdrawal. And my test will fail because it's not the exception that I expect. Because the one I'm expecting is the illegal value exception. So if I run this, I get a test failure and I'll get figure this factor. It's an unexpected exception because I'm expecting the legal value, but the exception I received was not enough money. Okay. So I'll change this back to negative 100. And now I'll point that. Questions about how we test exceptions? Pretty straightforward, right? Okay, so let's jump into jump into the next topic. So the, if you look at this bank class, you'll notice that in my try catch statements, I'm trying to handle two different exceptions. And I'm handling them in the same way. Right? So my, my catch my catch block for the legal value exception and my catch block for the not enough money exceptions are identical. And what that indicates is that I really think of these two exceptions in the same way. But I have no way to express that because they're actually distinct, distinct exceptions. 
So what we'll do now is actually apply Java's <coughs> inheritance concepts to exceptions. So it turns out that exceptions are just like classes. So there's nothing preventing me from subclass. So in fact, what you saw when we declared these exceptions, like the legal value exception, you saw that they extended some exception class that's part of the Java library. So what I'll do now is actually define a type hierarchy of my own that has to do with exceptions within this project. So I can define a top-level exception that has to do with accounts. And that'll be my account exception. And this guy was going to extend exception. And then down below, I'm going to subclass the account exception and create the specific exceptions that I care about. So down below, I can create the illegal value exception. And then it'll be one subclass of the account exception. And then my second subclass is going to be the other kind of exception that I have, which is the not enough money exception. really tiny type hierarchy. And the little tiny type hierarchy allows me to talk about the set of all of exception that are user defined within my project in terms of a single type, in terms of account exception. So it's an abstraction that I defined within my project to be able to reason about all, the set of all exceptions that have to do with account. So, to implement this thing, I obviously need a new class. So this is going to be the account exception class. So it's a, it's a class, and I'll have it extend exception. And going to have a very simple, very simple constructor just like the other exceptions where I would, I may create an object with some message, but it can also create just a blank account exception without, without any message. So that will be my abstract parent superclass. So I'm going to take this parent superclass and I'm going to subclass it within my individual exceptions that are already have. So I'll go to the legal value exception. And instead of extending exception, I'm going to extend the account exception. And now my super refers to account exception, not ex exception. And I'll do the same thing for not enough money exception. So I created this little type hierarchy. Now, the whole point right, was to handle those catch clauses where I have duplicate code. So if I go into bank again, I have this series of catch clauses which refer to the specific kinds of exceptions, kinds of account exceptions. And now I can just you know, remove all of these. Instead of reasoning about the individual exceptions, I can catch and account exceptions. And then within this block, I'll do what I typically did. Okay, 
is I simplified my code. I removed duplication. And I made it more abstract. Right? They're all good things. Right? So if you write code, you want it to be like this. Because you want to reason about the most abstract object possible. So now I'm catching the super type of the exception. So when there's an exception thrown with neither deposit to account or withdraw from account, this exception will either be a legal value exception or a not enough money exception. And both of those will match this catch, catch condition. Because both of them extend the account exception. So if I try to run this code, so now I'm depositing negative amount of money to my account. You know, my stack trace will still print out and I'll say deposit cannot be a negative number. And if I have a hundred dollars and then I try to withdraw five hundred, I'll still get the not enough money exception. And both of those stack traces were outputted by the same catch clause. Because both of the exceptions were handled by the account exception, which is a super clause. Again, this is going to be actual type and apparent type. So my apparent type of AE is account exception, but my actual type of AE is going to be either a legal value exception or not enough money exception. And so when I print out the stack trace, I'll get one of two stack traces, either one for a legal value exception or the one for not enough money exception. So if I, if I had no, you know, let's say this was 50. If I had no exceptions, then I won't get the stack trace. I just executed whatever is in the try statement. No exceptions occurred, so I don't execute my catch. So what I'm doing is I'm actually passing in legal values into those methods in order to trigger the exceptions. And depending on the kind of illegal value that I pass in, I'll get a different kind of exception. So if I try to deposit a negative amount of money, then the exception I'll get is a legal value. But if what I'm trying to do is take out too much money, then the exception that I'll get is not enough money exception. Right, so there are two statements here, and you can get an exception either in the first statement, deposit to account, or within withdraw from account. And so I was able to generate both. And I was able to handle both of them using the same code. Other questions? So what would happen if I... So now I have the super type, which is account exception. What if I had... What, what if I wanted to specialize my catch block? so that I handle the super type, but also handle one of the subtypes. So I may want to have a second class, catch class, which will be something like catch, not enough, money exception. Mimi. And I would do something else here. So I might do system dot out that print line. So how do you think this will be? Now I have a catch clause for my subtype, but I also have a catch clause for my super type. 
right? So this is legal syntax. I could write this down. The question is, what is going to happen? What do you think is going to happen? Does the code stop running after the first patch? <clears throat> so you can only execute one patch. Right? So what do you think will happen if you can only execute one patch? It's going to stop from going up when it finds the first one. Yeah, so if I run this code, so currently not enough money exception will be triggered, right? That's what it looks like. So if I run this code, then I'll just get oh too bad. <laughs> right, so I got my code to handle the exception here and not go on to handle it here. And of course if I had the negative amount of money, then I would go down here because not enough money exception doesn't match the legal value exception. Right, so the, the semantics of a try patch block is that you execute the try. If you get an error, you're going to go through all of the catch blocks one at a time. You're going to try to match the first one. And once you find one that matches, you'll execute the catch block, and then you'll stop. Because you never execute more than one catch block. Okay? So here, this account exception block will never be executed for not enough money exception. So in other words, this is identical to replacing this with the legal value exception. Yeah? So why don't we return? Can we get rid of it? Yeah, what's the point of return? So return ends this method, right? So there's some stuff at the bottom. Here it just prints out the account values. So for this example, I don't need a return. But in practice, you actually want to change the execution flow in some way. Right, so maybe you want to abort the function. Is that different from break? Uh, it is different from break because return is a way of ending the function, ending the method call. Right, so if I took out this return in here, then I'll get one more print statement at the bottom, which will be the account information. And that's due to the fact that after executing the catch, I went on to execute the next statement. So for this example, return is not necessary, but I just have it. OK, what about if my account exception was above not enough money exception? What would happen then? Yeah, well, in that case, the not enough money catch block will never execute. Right? In fact, we can try to do this. We can swap the catches, put it up here. And you'll see that Eclipse actually underlines this guy in red. And the problem is that this will be unreachable catch block for the not enough money exception. So Eclipse will actually reason through the fact that the not enough money exception will always be handled in the first cache. And so you'll never get to the bottom. You'll never be able to run the second cache block. So this is dead code. That is, this code will never be reached to any possible execution. Right? So that's the original one. Right? This was where we started. So super types within the exceptional hierarchy allow me to generalize my catch blocks, right? Allow me to write less code. They also allow me to expose fewer things. So, for example, the fact that deposit to account and withdraw from account may throw two different kinds of exceptions. That may actually reveal too much detail about how my code is implemented. So perhaps really what the client, what the library should do is just throw the account exception and then have the bank handle this more abstract, higher level exception. So there's kind, of, there's kind of an abstraction question here as well, because your library can decide to throw the more abstract exception in order to reveal fewer implementation details. Okay, so 
what about checked and unchecked exceptions? So there's so right now we've been dealing solely with checked exceptions. So all of these exceptions are ones that we define and are exceptions that everyone has to handle. So if I throw an exception with an account, like an illegal value exception, then this exception must be declared. Right? I cannot throw an exception without declaring it. And if you're using deposit, like bank uses deposit or my tests use deposit, then you must handle it. Right? You must either catch it or you must declare the fact that you, know, you throw it. And whoever calls you must be able to handle it. So checked exceptions require that the caller do something about the exception. So in Java, there's actually a second type of exception. And the second type is called unchecked exception. So here's a little, uh, little type diagram for the exception. So when we're talking about exception, which is this guy, all of the ones in red are checked. That is, when I throw an exception or anything that subclasses exception you know, in, on my own, when we declare new exceptions, we actually create new branches here. Right? Those exceptions are checked, so they must be defined, and they must be declared, and must be caught. But you may also have unchecked exceptions. And unchecked exceptions here are in blue. And runtime exception is a great example of that. So runtime exception is an exception that may occur during the course of your program. And we don't require that you declare it, and we don't require that you catch it. Because if, you, if we did, there would be way too many of these. Right? Because there are many runtime exceptions that may actually occur. Like, you know, Java runs out of memory. Right? Or maybe you divide it by zero. So division operations are everywhere in your code. So you don't want to constantly declare the fact that you can divide by zero. So you just treat it as a runtime exception. Just say, this thing may occur. And whoever wants to handle it can handle it. You can still catch a runtime exception, but you don't have to actually declare, declare it. Okay? So this makes the code a little bit easier to write. So in my, in my exception that hierarchy, this account exception right now extends exception. And so it must be a checked exception. So it must be declared and caught and so forth. But it could actually change this and it could extend a runtime exception. And when I do this, I don't have to declare it. So my code still compiles. It's OK to declare it, the fact that you throw it. But I could now actually remove my, my throw statements. So here I throw my legal value exception. But you know it's very verbose, so I can just remove that. And my code still compiles. It's still completely fine. Which is a little dangerous, right, if you think about it. So my checked exceptions require me to reason through exceptional control flow. Whereas unchecked exceptions, they're just stuff that may happen, and I omit them for brevity, because I don't want to be typing them out all the time. But they still may happen, right? So there's no guarantee that you're avoiding them. So in this case, users of deposit are not required to handle this exception, this illegal value exception, but you do this at your own risk. So in general, when you create exceptions of your own, you have to think about whether there's some way in which an exception, like an account exception, can be handled. If it can, then it should extend exception, because there's some way of dealing with it. But if you can't actually do anything about an account exception, like it's a division by zero, and just throw your hands up and you crash their program. In that case, you make it a runtime exception. Okay, so that's really the difference between the two, the two kinds of exceptions. Check and uncheck. Great. So we have one last topic. So I'll change this back to exception. And my account. So now my account complains, so I have to add a throws declaration.
So the last thing that we'll talk about is the finally clause. So if you look on the bank name method again. So here I'm trying to deposit and then I'm withdrawing something and then there might, you know, an exception may occur in the middle. Now, when that happens, you typically want some kind of cleanup action to occur as well. And this is what you use the finally clause for. So finally is just a clause at the very bottom. You could put it at the bottom, doesn't matter where you put it. So a finally clause always runs. So here I can, I can say something like, um, you know, sending an email to client about bad, bad account status, something like that. So let's say that you always want to send, well, so maybe sending email, sending email to client about uh, transaction failed or not. So let's say you always want to send the client an email, whether or not the transaction actually succeeded. Because the transaction did not succeed, you want to let them know about the fact that it was attempted. So you would add a finally clause here, and so if I execute this method now. I got an exception, which is the illegal value exception, but I still sent the client an email. Now, if my exception was different, if my exception was retrieve, you know, not enough money exception, and execute it, then the email to client would still would still run. And then finally, if I don't have an exception, like in this case, I'm still sending email to client. So regardless of what happens in my try and catch, you know, if my try has no exceptions, if my try has exceptions and I executed catch blocks, if my try had an exception uh, and then raised an exception, regardless, the final clause will always execute. So this is really useful for you know things that must be like fail safe. You must do this no matter what. And it's also really useful for cleanup actions. So I may open a new file here, I may start, start writing to it, I may create a database, but I may not complete all of my operations. So here, in my finally clause, I'll say, oh, well, I need to remove the file, I need to close the database, maybe remove this database because now it's corrupted. And so it'll basically handle all the cleanup actions for my code. Okay, so I can put finally, associated with any try-catch block. And it's good practice to actually have this execute because this is guaranteed to execute. Whereas the code in try-catch, you never know. You never know if you're going to make it to this line. Because there may be an exception here which will prevent you from executing this line. Right? So it's very difficult to reason about the sequence of statements that will actually be executed control flow-wise in your try statement which is why you need the final line to do any kind of cleanup actions to bring your system into a system state. Okay. Great. Any questions about exceptions at all? Pointer cases? Where I would use them, you think? Yeah. Uh, does finally run if, if, even if there are no Yes, finally runs always. So if my try, try block. What's the difference between doing it? Okay, okay, I get it. Because this finally even runs after return as well, right? Uh, yeah, so, so finally will run even if, even if I have a return statement. But I have a even better one for you. So if I have an exception here, I may actually throw a new exception. Just fail. So I may, I may have an exception here, probably have to, let's say add a throws, right? So my main can, can throw an exception. So in this case, I actually generated a new exception within my try statement, not within any of the methods that I'm calling. And this exception is not handled by any of my catches, right? So what happens now? Well, execution stops and I return, right? 
except that when you have a finally clause, you will always execute the finally. Well, now I have a reachable code, so let me just comment that out. So if I execute this, my, my stack trace is, you know, exception. So this exception was thrown, but it still managed to execute sending email to client. Right, so even if I throw an exception manually within the try statement, right, I'll still execute the finally. So finally, always press. For questions? Man, you guys are ready for midterm number two. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're definitely going to cover this on midterm. Oh, look, more questions. Okay. So what happens if you put the final clause without any try and catch? If I put the final clause without what? Without any try and catch. I could have a final clause without any try and catch. Um, without a try? Oh, cool. I could have. We did definitely do this. Would it be a code that always executes regardless of what happens before? Yeah, so, okay. well, so this, this is what this code looks like. I think without a try, I think that's the behavior I'll have. So you mean if I have no try statement? I think you're required to have a try statement. Um, I'm not, not certain, but I think you see it. So this is, this is legal. Okay, we can have the midterm. Let's talk about the midterm. Uh, midterm. Okay, so we finished creating the midterm. Here's a uh, here's a histogram of the midterm of the midterm score. So this is a frequency. So higher bars mean more people in those bins, and the bins are according to percentages. Right. So the bin in the middle. Corresponds to 50%. 50% off 60 is 30. Right? So as you can see, it's uh, almost normally distributed, which is great. So that means about, you know, most people got are in those like in that middle section. Right? So this is for both sections. So both for this section as well as Gale sections. So we had a lot of people who were at the top, so like 15 people. Close to one, and then the lowest I got is to 30% off of 60, which is about 20, 18. All right, so that's how low the scores got. So this is the midterm. I uh, what I'll do now is actually go over the midterm. So I have the answer key open up, and we have a bit of time to go through it. Not too much time. So if you have any any deep questions about it, you should come see me in office hours or come to me. So the, the first question was a, a flowchart. So the flowchart was, was pretty, pretty straightforward. You had a for loop, and then you had an if statement within the for loop. And so you needed arrows. So people got points taken off for not having arrows and not having the, the diamond shape. Right? You needed diamonds to actually indicate choice. And then for every diamond, you needed a true and a false branch. And so basically you had those top diamond which corresponded to the for loop, and then the inner diamond corresponding to the conditional within the for loop. So really kind of straightforward. I feel like we've done a bunch of these in class. So um, 1B was the really was the really difficult question I felt for most of you. So 1B had to do with testing. So it really depended on this diagram. And it required you to think about the paths in this diagram. So when we're talking about paths in the program, execution paths, right? We're talking about actual paths that start at start and then terminate at end. So you have to think about what are the possible ways in which I can, you know, start at start and then end up at end. And it turns out there's really three ways. The first way is to go start, execute 67, execute 69, and then take the false branch, execute 74. So that was one of the answers, right? One of the ways to traverse this diagram is to skip the body of the loop entirely. And that's the case that corresponds to the, when you have no photos in your code. 
And then the second case corresponds to where you go here, and then you enter the for loop because there are photos. But the evaluation of this if statement is false, so you come back out, and then you jump to the bottom. So the second, the second path here is to go down, to come back to 69, then come back. And then the final path is to go down all the way, right? So there are photos in my collection, and the photos match the date that I requested. So I reach 71, where I actually collect those photos. I come back to my 69, and then I jump out of my 74. So those were the three paths, right? And that's what the, what the answer key is listing. And the key to the question was not just the paths, but also reasoning about the key. So you have a path, but now how do I actually force my program to take that path? And in order for that to happen, I actually have to tell you, well, you know, my photos, uh, you know, my photos collection has one photo, and it has the following date. So it didn't require you to actually use Java for this. You could have written it in any kind of legal English. You, know, you could express it any way you wanted. We accepted all kinds of dates. You know, this could be milliseconds or hours or years, whatever. The, the key was that you had to tell us what is the contents of photos. Because if I don't know the contents of photos, then I cannot reasonably take a path in that flow diagram. And then the second half to the, to the method, to, to this test is that I actually have to invoke the method. Right? So I actually have to give you a call that will now direct me down this, down this flow diagram. And so the call needed to include you know, find photos in date range. It had to look like a call. And then it had to have a couple of arguments. And the arguments, again, they could be arbitrary dates. Could be any format you wish. And so for each path, the state and the invocation have to correspond to the path. Right? So there's interdependence between all three of those. OK. So that's, that's 1A, 1B. So 2 was a call graph. It's kind of like the simplest call graph. Uh, we did way more difficult call graphs in class. Uh, so this one was just like one level deep. You look at this method, you say, here's a bunch of methods, you list them down, and you're done. Right, the key to this was having arrows. Some people didn't have arrows. Some people had arrows pointing the wrong way. It's also a big no -no. Right, So this is a call graph, very simple. It just you know, started at the top, and then you, then you triple down. And then B, there are a couple of bugs. So the bug questions, uh, 2B was pretty simple, where essentially, if you read the specification for the method, it told you that the bombs have to move. And then if you drew the call graph, you actually know that nothing is being done to bombs. Right? So the, the key thing is that you're missing a move bomb. So that was the, that was the key here. And you can move the bombs really anywhere, right? There's a lot of places where you could insert this, this thing. The key was to realize that the bombs needed to be one. And the second bug, it was a little bit more tricky. So the second bug had to do with a statement. So when you have bombs that are dropped by the invaders, if they collide with the tank, then the tank must be destroyed. But if you see here, the actual check for collision is right above. So this statement for destroying the tank is in the wrong spot. So really what needed to happen is this statement must have been inside the if statement. And then the game would function normally. There was another kind of bug that people noticed, the fact that uh, bombs were not removed all. We gave partial credit for that bug fix because it didn't actually uh, handle the, the major problem, which is that the game started in game over state. And always destroyed the tank. Uh, type hierarchy. So this was, uh, I thought this was pretty challenging when I was doing the, the test myself. Uh, you had to look at a lot of code, right? So, so this was, we warned you, right? You have to know it flips, and you have to know it really well to navigate large code bases. So midterm number two, you're going to get bigger code bases. Okay? So you have to be prepared to use that tool effectively. Right? You're going to have hundreds of classes. How do you actually make sense of classes? How do you find them? How do you know the type? Right? So the easiest way to solve this 
question was to draw a little type hierarchy and then just figure out what is a subclass, what is a superclass. You know, there were two folds in here. So I think this guy was an abstract class. So it required you to notice the fact that it's an abstract class and you cannot create an abstract class. And then here, arrow link target, I think, was an interface. So again, you cannot instantiate a new, a new object of type that is an interface. So it required you kind of some critical thinking and really using that tool effectively. And that's the key to solving this. this uh, e involved thinking about substitutability, so it's preconditioned for and stuff. So it's just very straight up application of that rule. And then the final one, the sequence diagram, is pretty straightforward as well. You had lifelines, so we needed to make sure that you could reason about how many lifelines there are, one per object, and you're, that you're making the right call to each object. Right, so again, it wasn't any more difficult than the stuff we did in the class. Okay, so that's my brief midterm review. Uh, see you all on Friday. I missed that whole part of last year. It sounded pretty important.